Okay, I am joined here with Luca Vasil of Bagged, which has been nominated for our comedy category at Buntingford Shorts 2021. How are you, Luca? Hi, hi. Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, excited for the interview. <laughs> good. Glad to hear. So let's just, just jump straight into it then. Um, for those that don't obviously know about you, uh, do you want to introduce yourself and how you got into filmmaking? Right. Okay. Well, I'm Luca. Uh, I'm 18, soon 19. Uh, I'm from Romania, Bucharest, and uh, I don't know where in my life my passion for, for filmmaking really started, but uh, I could say that I've been doing like short films in a more like taking it seriously manner uh, for about four or five years, maybe. Oh, wow. Is there, so when you, when you made the decision to go professional and this is exactly what, what you wanted to do, was there anything in particular that sparked that or is it, was it just a sort uh, of feeling? It's always been that I wanted to make films uh, and it's always been my dream to like become a director. And I think it was seeded because my dad used to work uh, at the National Theatre in uh -huh. Bucharest and he was doing sound and I was sort of, he would take me backstage and I would see like what's happening behind the curtain quite literally. Yeah. And uh, then there's also Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which is a film he'd like show me on and on. And at the end he was like, look, directed by Steven Spielberg. And I was like, whoa, this guy made this? I want to do that. Yeah. So then, <laughs> then four years ago, I sort of like shifted into another thing with magic tricks, did a YouTube channel with teaching magic tricks online. And I learned how to edit stuff. And I realized, wait a minute, I don't want to do magic. I want to like make movies, but now I know how to edit. So that's how I veered off into like, I wrote a first script and stuff like that. Oh, wow. So who knows, you'll have the next Now You See Me film ready to go soon as well with all the magic skills. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, so as we mentioned right at the start, Bagged is your latest short film, a dark comedy. Uh, and it's obviously yeah. been nominated as a finalist this year. Um, I was having a little read before this and it, I found that it was crowdfunded. Uh, what made you want to go down the crowdfunding route and how did that play out? Well, uh, it was and still is <laughs> my most ambitious project to date. Uh, even though I've had like another project which was of pretty big scale as well. But uh, the thing with the, this was like over the years, I learned to like do all the jobs, wear all the hats because that's how you start. Uh, and I'm sort of trying to like pass those hats on to other people now. And with this one, I knew I didn't want to operate the camera anymore. I knew I wanted to focus on the directing. Mm -hmm. So I knew that that was going to mean get a DOP. That's going to mean a bigger budget. That's going to mean a whole bunch of things. Uh, so I knew that we had to crowdfund it. And uh, how I went about it, well, pretty much what I just said, uh, besides presenting what the film is to the crowdfunding audience, I said, this is a next step for me, for my, for my filmmaking, I don't know, endeavors. And I need to, this is sort of, kind of my film school, so to speak. Like <laughs> I'm trying to go to the next step. And for that, I need some money so I can pay all these wonderful people. So I can, again, evolve as a director, evolve towards what I want to do eventually. Yeah. And we did raise through Indiegogo 4,500 euros. Wow. Uh, which was terrific. And it was just through word of mouth, like letting friends know, letting like relatives know, they let their friends and relatives know. And honestly, uh, there's a bunch of good people out there. So like people shouldn't be afraid to like ask for, ask other people to invest in them and in their projects because uh, nice things happen. And we did manage to raise the, the sum needed and make the film. So, yeah. I mean, that's the most important thing. As long as it gets made and as long as it gets out there. Yeah. I suppose yeah. that's the same thing. You, you just mentioned about um, sort of having to sort of take off all the hats and just put on a single hat. Was that really hard or was it um, easier than you anticipated? 
Well, the hard thing is it's been easier because I'm still a very visual director. Like I would, my DOP, I kept talking about, I, I knew the framing, I knew the shot list. He was more on the side of like, yeah, he's operating the camera. He knows how to place the lights and everything and what lights are needed. But really it was more interesting in terms of having to learn to communicate, not just with the other crew to get my ideas across because I'm pretty good at that and have been pretty good at that. Um, but with the actors, that was the tricky thing. I'd never properly had like focused on directing actors because you're behind the camera, you tell them some things and then you're focused on, on filming it and you don't know necessarily what to say after a take to, to your mm -hmm. actors. So while they're act, so if I'm in front of a monitor, someone else is operating and I'm seeing how the scene's working out, I can already think, okay, this is this, this is what we need to change here. This is what I have to tell her. How should I go about this? Because that's not quite right. And yeah, directing actors was, was the most uh, interesting thing, especially because I had uh, two professional act actresses, which was, again, a first for me, which was very intimidating at first. But professional actors are so lovely, turns out. So the, and they help you out a lot. Uh, and of course, unprofessional actors, which were my, my, my colleagues. So I had to also learn how to balance those two out and how to direct the pros with the, with the amateurs without making either feel a bit uncomfortable i suppose as well precisely yeah yeah okay that's interesting so i think especially with such ambitious characters and uh quite developed characters like mary in the film i suppose that gives a bit of an extra challenge in itself it's not it's not like a it wasn't a simple this is your character do this yes exactly exactly i mean it's more about uh, the thing is, like, uh, the the girl who plays Mary, uh, she is, like, she is in an acting group. She's been for, like, a few years already. So she knows she's really good at stage acting. This was her first film. So with her, like, the, the getting and understanding the character and all that in pre-production, talking through her, doing re rehearsals. We had the luxury to do rehearsals. <laughs> um was very very important uh and she got that really easily the things that were more complicated is like uh very different from the theater world in filmmaking you're doing like little bits and pieces so her getting into character doing the thing and then getting out of character for such a short amount of time was was the hard thing for her and that's where i sort of had to guide her and help her out but she's been amazing in terms of like how nuanced she managed to play the part of mary like mm. that's credit goes to her there <laughs> <laughs> oh you could tell it paid off because the character is so effective thinking oh, about yeah. <laughs> the how sort of bagged came to be what was the sort of inspirations behind the project this is a very big anomaly for me because I generally <laughs> don't get an idea like this, not, not an idea, an entire idea for a story like start to end. I generally don't, that doesn't happen. But with this one, it was amazing because like it was about, I don't know, sort of late spring 2018 and I stepped into the shower and just, I don't know what on earth happened. I mean, the shower is one of the places where you get ideas. Uh, <laughs> but for the 10 minutes that I took the shower, like everything from start to finish came to me. Like I can't, I couldn't believe it. Like I had exactly the idea of this sort of circular beginning and ending. I knew that she was going to sort of spoiler to people who haven't seen it, imagine it all. And I knew that like, uh, I knew some of the gags, of course, not to that e extreme detail, but I knew exactly that this is going to be the structure, even the ending line, if only it were so simple, that was stuck stuck with the script and in my head from the very get-go which is yeah it's surprising i don't know how it happened but it has so <laughs> wow and, and i suppose for a filmmaker based on your other films as well that's quite rare <laughs> very very no because other films generally start out with well i want to make something in this genre because i want to train my i don't know uh tension creating muscles or something like that uh or i want to have an idea for a scene or i have an idea for a character or something and then you sort of come up with a story around that but with this it was i don't know how it came how it came like that but i think it's also why i really took my time with me and my co-writer karina developing this over like a year and a half until we actually said okay let's shoot because the fact that the idea came like that and that I liked it and that there were obviously some themes there as well. I didn't want to like just do it and not do it properly. I wanted to take yeah. my time and make this. It, it felt special. It felt like, well, if the idea came like that, let's, let's make it like worth it. Give it the time it deserves. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
So obviously, um, for those that have seen the film and those that may see the film after watching this, it's very grand, very over the top in terms of elegance. Um, yeah. Was that a purposeful decision? What made you sort of go down that route? Yeah, like our production title was over the top. Oh, right. Uh, for the film. <laughs> yeah, 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 but it was way too generic and it's also a Sylvester Stallone 1980s wrestling film. So we didn't want to be associated necessarily with that, although that would have been very over the top indeed. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was the point. The point was to create... I mean, almost a Wes anderson ridiculous world, but also very slapsticky, very maybe even Edgar Wright-ish mm. with some of the comedic beats and like over-the-top reactions and stuff like that. So uh, the entire idea was to make it as ridiculous as it can be. And of course, this might not work for some people because like various people have various levels of their, where, where they suspend their disbelief. <laughs> but... But the idea would be you'd buy into it, you'd buy into this crazy, ridiculous world. And then at the end, of course, it'd be all flipped over. And not just in an, ah, it was all a dream way, but in a, ah, ah I shouldn't worry about this, you know, way. It has, it has more than a, like, I dreamed, I just imagined it all message. It's, it's, there's a realization there, you know, there's not a little character arc as in she got away with it or whatever. It's as in she got over it, which I thought was, was much, much nicer. Mm, but okay. yeah, we had to make it very, very like surreal because uh, honestly, it's part of the dark comedy aspect of it as well. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, for the character, especially having those thoughts of, oh, I would love to get away with doing that. But then obviously thinking, actually, I probably shouldn't, I probably won't get away with it in some respects <laughs> after yeah. playing through the scenes in your head. Um, and there are some very um, creative sort of over the top imagination scenes within the film as well. I feel like you'll know one of the ones I'm going to mention, but um, especially the scene where and this is going to have a, a big spoiler, I suppose, the body parts come flying out the window. <laughs> How? Why? It's amazing. <laughs> uh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, well, that one was interesting because uh, we, we didn't know how to, like, show, we realized at a certain point during rehearsals that it would be ridiculous to have her, like, just drag a big... I don't know why I thought that if you chop someone into pieces, they'll be lighter or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But 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 then I realized, okay, let's, let's make it... Let's make her struggle. Like, she is sort of superwoman, at a, at, a, at a certain point, but let's let's make her struggle a bit here. And then, as we were rehearsing, one of the actors, actually the guy who's quote unquote chopped up, um, says, "Well, what if what if she throws me into pieces? Like, why doesn't she chop me and throw me?" And I'm like, "Stop right there." <laughs> okay, we see her dragging the bag. She thinks for a bit, she's tired, and then we see one bag falling out. And it looks like it's the entire bag. But then we see another one, and we realize, oh, no, they're limbs. And then another one, and another one. And it's going to be the blue Danube. Uh, again, only after I released the film, people started saying, oh, that's like from 2001, A Space Odyssey. No, it's not. It's a piece of classical music. But, yeah, it's associated with that. Anyway, yeah, so that, that was the idea. Like, yeah, the blue Danube with all the, like, limbs falling out and everything. Uh... I don't know. I, I, I knew it was, I hoped it was going to be funny. Apparently it was because that's the most like all the people I've talked to highlight that as their favorite part of the film. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that's how that came about. Uh, and honestly, the fact that there are more limbs than they, they, than they should be in that sequence wasn't intended. I actually miscounted the musical beats in the <laughs> piece. So then I was like, okay, I'm going to have to reuse some other takes of other limbs. To... <laughs> I, su yeah. I suppose, like, to the average viewer, they would never notice it. But well, yeah, yeah, yeah. but again, it, it pushes the surreal, ridiculous vibe forward. Yeah, exactly. And I think you, you touched on one of the other things that I found quite interesting. There's a lot of classical music in the film as well. Um, what does that mean to you within the film? And also, is that, like, a personal favourite thing? Or... Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, Mary, Mary is, uh, a, is a fairly smart and sharp character, but she's still a teenager who, like, you know, really takes to heart many things which, like, at that age clearly aren't, like, as shouldn't be taken as seriously. Um, 
but she is a very clever teenager because that's why she imagines all the or at least some of the possible things that could go wrong throughout the film such as like the whole scene with the mother that's really quite realistic to to a certain extent like in comparison to the whole school sequence um but but the idea was okay uh mary's clever mary likes all sorts of stuff as you can see from like the mise-en-scene in her room um mary's very quirky very hippie she likes to likes this sort of she's imagining this sort of old schoolish world where like it's clearly like how she's dressed and how other characters are dressed it's contemporary but it's not it's sort of timeless as this 60s 70s vibe yeah. and also mary likes classical music because like she listens to all types of music and she would use that music in her head or maybe for real if she were to do this that's what would be playing in her head to like dramatize it all definitely i think you just get that as, like the the build up of the classical music and it is recognizable by quite a lot of people as well which probably makes it that a little bit more f- uh, familiar uh, yeah, yeah 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 i mean again i try to use pieces of recognizable music especially in the key moments just to distinguish them because there is classical music throughout and not all of them are like as recognizable of course there's a bunch of like vivaldi and uh <laughs> and uh, strauss in there uh but again i use the very recognizable like vivaldi and strauss pieces in key moments to highlight them mm. so yeah definitely and i think uh, you also mentioned with the mise en scene there are some very brilliant, subtle references to like Psycho uh, is the one that I noticed right at the start. Yeah, um, yeah. And for those that obviously watch it a, a few times, you do start picking mm-hmm. up on them. And it is really interesting to see the level of detail that went in to build. Yeah, g- again, that's the like, again, uh, sort of create more background and character on Mary. Because with short films, it's even more important than like features to yeah. do this t- to, to, to let the audience know what what character is this because why would we ca- care about her in such a short amount of time you know hmm. so give the audience little bits and pieces also again it motivates her crazy ideas i mean she's got a psycho poster there you know <laughs> then there's also heather's one which you see a little later which again heather's has been a pretty big influence on the film Funny thing is I watched Heather's a long time after the idea came to me, but it's such, such a similar film in terms of the like, dark comedy aspect of it. Mm. And I think you get that Heather's vibe of the, the, sort of the school, the way that Mary dresses in the school especially. Yeah, yeah. Heather's was a big like, influence in terms of the costumes and everything, yeah. So were there any other influences, uh, sort of film, directors-wise within Bags, or even just for yourself in general? Mm-hmm. Well, for myself in general, I mean, sorry to anyone who hates him, but Spielberg is <laughs> is my uh, my guru. Uh, I mean, not even consciously, you know, having watched not just like Close Encounters, but many other films of his as I was little. I, that's, I mean, filmmaking sort of like I absorbed it in his way, in his style. And like my very first films, I didn't necessarily know all the like filmmaking techniques but i had a gut instinct of where to place the camera and how to move it and stuff like that you know that it looked filmic without me knowing that this is a dolly move or so on and so forth Mm -hmm. um so spielberg is definitely looming there like just unconsciously you know uh (laughs) that that sounds really dark actually uh but not literally uh but i mean other references specifically for back um definitely in terms of the slapsticky moments some charlie chaplin uh buster keaton uh oliver and hardy type of things um lauren laurel and hardy sorry um and Again, Wes Anderson is is pretty big in there. Uh, Edgar Wright with like stuff such as uh, Hot Fuzz or uh, especially Scott Pilgrim and some of the like ridiculous and again, teenage high school ish mm. aspects of it. Uh, but I'm I'm I was surprised that it didn't come out because it it was. I mean, Wes Anderson in terms of visuals was a very big reference, which is why, especially at, in the school sequence and the whole bathroom sequence, the color palette is very deliberate, very pastel-like, very simple. But I'm happy that it didn't, you don't necessarily feel a Wes Anderson vibe. It doesn't feel like a, I don't know, tribute movie or something, you know, which uh, I'm quite happy about that. Yeah, I think it is hard for, for filmmakers sometimes if they've got that inspiration in mind 
to accidentally create a replica. And as you said, it just doesn't feel that way. It feels like a yeah. a Luca Facile production, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So I was watching your behind the scenes video on YouTube and it was mentioning about the production and how the bathroom scenes in particular were very complicated. <laughs> yes. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, again, uh, this is my former school where we shot this. I'm now in the UK. That was in Romania. And uh, huge school, like 1,200 students, like big, big old school, like classic Romanian school, huge hallways, wonderful bathrooms. Um, but no bathroom was perfect. Like they're big. They're like spacious. There's, there's a bunch of like, like, like it would be in a shopping mall, you know? Uh, but no bathroom was perfect. And for some reason, as I was writing the script, because I knew I was going to have access to the school, uh, as I was writing the script and imagining the scene, I thought that there was this exact bathroom like there in the school. And then I went and started scouting and I realized, no, it is, there, there is no bathroom like the one I've actually imagined. So I have to fake it and put it together. So we shot in three different bathrooms. Um... And yeah, there's a big one where all the like bathroom stalls are. There's one where the kitchen, the, the sink area is. And then there's one that we especially shot for the door because for like the door to one of the other two, actually to both open like on the outside, not on the inside. So her taping the mop wouldn't make any sense. Yeah. Of course it yeah. doesn't make any sense either, but you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, uh, it would have been even more ridiculous now that I think of it, someone just opening the door the other way around, actually. But yeah, I think that's a gag that's been done before. Um, and more, more than that, I had to shoot it cleverly so that I could make it seem like there's one single space. But more than that, how do you fit all the equipment in like, a, I don't know, 80 by 80 bathroom stall? And the actors... <laughs> Not big, is it? <laughs> Yeah, so we had to, to like build sort of a mini set for this. We had to build a bigger bathroom stall with like removable walls and everything. And we just propped that up against the, the wall so that we didn't have to like buy also some tiles and create a fake like wall yeah. over there. So we just had that there. We, we like figured out everything. I tried to also like deliberately jump the 180 line uh, for some scenes where like, the situation changes, such as when the boy like enters the, the bathroom and disturbs the whole thing, you know. Uh, again, we jump the line to show that, oh, something's wrong now. This is going to be an issue. How do we solve it? So again, it was, but again, it was really about cleverly shooting angles and getting them all together. There are no pans because I couldn't have done that because I would have shown that it's not the same place. And I really like how it came out like this. I mean, I'm surprised that no one else noticed. And even people who I've actually told that we're going to shoot in three different, different bathrooms like a while back were like, oh my God, you shot in three bathrooms? I can't believe it. <laughs> they had forgotten and they, and they saw the film and they didn't even like remember, you know? So I yeah. I just think it just looks so seamless. And because of the kind of setting, it just seems plausible that the mm -hmm. door would look like that. The sinks would be there, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it, so yeah, it's movie quiet. magic, the power of editing. Exactly. <laughs> so thinking more a little bit about the production side of things then, I'm sure it was uh, quite a long shoot. Um, yeah. <laughs> but also quite an entertaining shoot. Was there any sort of particularly funny moments that you can share with us from the, from the filming? Well, um, I currently don't have the luxury to be the funny guy on set. Uh, I'd love to. I'd love to be the more like, uh, well, in a bright mood and so on and so forth on set. But I still don't have all those hats off. I still wear the producer hat, which is where the whole uh, pressure comes from. Mm. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it was a long shoot. We had to shoot for four days initially. Uh, some things didn't go right. That went on for six days in the end. Thankfully, we were able to get the school for more days. So thank you very much to the <laughs> staff at the school for allowing me to keep on shooting there. Uh, and funny things on set. Well, I'm the guy who's always, if you're going to, and you'll see in the new behind the scenes episodes as I'll put them out on the production and everything. I'm the guy who's always, you might see him in the background of like a shot with someone else being like, <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> uh, 
and unintentionally just <laughs> uh, because things go wrong. Uh, the bigger the production, the more things can go wrong. Mm. Um, but of course, bigger productions allow for bigger movies. So that, that's the compromise. They go hand in hand. Um, but while, of course, we had issues one day, the cameras just wouldn't shoot. Jammed stuff. I mean, not jammed because it wasn't filmed, but like just weird technical issues. Uh, my cast and some of the crew literally while me and like the DOP and some other uh, technical guys were trying to figure out what's going on, went to get another camera, stuff like that. My entire cast shot an entire parody of like a sitcom <laughs> and they even released that, like edited it on their, on the phone and like released that. It was, it was, and that was hilarious, like a very bad, like Romanian sitcom type of thing. Uh, or actually it was a reality TV show. It doesn't matter. Like, so, uh, and there were funny moments on set. production is hilarious in itself. <laughs> well yeah, yeah yeah no and there's there's a bunch of funny moments stuff like i again my dop like like my like the focus puller just making him laugh and him not being able to get the shot because he's <laughs> like <laughs> so there's like a bunch of little funny moments but honestly it's so hard for me to remember because it was like over a year ago oh wow uh and there's so much behind the scenes. And again, I was so in my head during those days that honestly, I've seen most of these funny things in the behind the scenes. But yeah, no, everyone had a lot of fun on set. Like I was the only guy who was like, had to really focus and <laughs> must be, be worried about. Must be serious, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think that's, uh, as you said, it was just a year ago now. So obviously it's been on the film festival circuit for a while. It's now out on YouTube. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. How's the reception been? Well, uh, surprisingly good. Uh, the thing that happens with all films is you make them, you work on them, and you're really at a, from a point on, you can only, other than your initial gut instincts, your whole life, you can only rely on the feedback that people give you. Because mm. uh, you don't know, does this work? Does this not work? You're you're seeing the edit hundreds and hundreds of times. You don't know if the pacing's right anymore. You, so uh, we spent a lot of time in post production. We actually didn't finish shooting. We had to get four more shots, and the whole pandemic thing got started, unfortunately. And I was like, okay, we'll be a month in lockdown. We'll be back to get the four shots afterwards. That extended, of course. And I was like, oh God, okay, I have, to, I have to do something. I have to put it together with what I have. And I have put it together with what I had and it ended up much better, surprisingly. Um, and I'll go, actually, like if I'm, I'll, I'll let it, I'll, at the end of the interview, I'll tell people like where they can find the whole uh, making ofs and everything so that they can see. I'm not going to go into detail on that now. But again, it, it was a really long post-production. We had to wait a lot on stuff. We started out with a sound designer who was really professional but couldn't help me constantly. And that was a really slow process. Mm. Uh, so then we had to, at, at a certain point, I had to go, okay, I really like what you're doing, but we, we I really want to release this film. I'll have to like get someone else to finish it. Uh, but in the end, we finished it. I had started submitting it to festivals. It already had won some awards at some festivals. So the reception from that point of view was amazing. Uh, I was so lucky that I actually managed to see it on a big screen because I would have done a premiere for it, just like thank the whole cast and crew and everything. Uh, but again, I, I had the chance to see it on a big screen at a festival uh, somewhere in the summer when cinemas were open and everything. So that was, that was really, really good. It was unfinished in terms of sound, but I saw it on a big screen, so yeah. And then again, audience reception, uh, teenagers loved it. I was surprised that not all teen teenagers fully get it. It's more the cinephile teenagers that yeah. also get all the tropes and like the whole aspect of it, but they still enjoy all the gags and everything, you know? So, uh, yeah. And then there's, of course, people who like, again, dark comedy is not for everyone. Really over the top silly things are, or comedy pretty much isn't for everyone. Uh, but it's 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 been a terrific reception. So yeah, I'm and here here I am at the festival. So <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we must be one of the the last of the festivals to have it because it is now publicly available, which will tell everyone where yeah. they can go see it. Uh, yeah, well, it's 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 on YouTube. 
It's uh, Light Ray Films is the channel. And I mean, if you search for bagged Light Ray Films or just Light Ray Films, it'll pop up. And again, that's where I'm also like uh, uploading the making of series for it. And that's where you can also find my, my other films as well. So, yeah. Yeah, so people check that one out <laughs> because there are some very, very interesting uh, productions on there. So then just sort of to finish off and thinking about your plans for the future, Obviously, we are in the midst of a, a pandemic, so we're a little bit stuck on that front. Um, mm -hmm. But have you got any ideas for productions of the future? Anything that you'd like to achieve? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, currently there are no new. There is no new short film like in development or new new projects, personal projects. Because uh, I get involved in all sorts of like other friends' projects and like few client projects here and there uh but my personal projects not really ideas i have of course those bits and pieces of ideas because i i don't think it will ever happen i mean if it will then wow but if it'll ever happen for me to get a idea like that again that'd be amazing uh but there are bits and pieces of ideas of course but nothing seems to like materialize currently um I sort of also switch between a period of like creating and consuming stuff where I like now I've been for the past six months in a period of like constantly watching films and I'm sort of like worried that God, this isn't good. This is, I'm starting to worry like, well, am I actually like lazy or not? But I realized, no, wait, after each single film I did and my average is I sort of release a film every year and a half or so, I do get a six month period after each film where I just consume, just let ideas, look for ideas. It's not, it's not mm. like, okay, on to the next thing. It's never been. Um, in terms of what I'd love to do, like hopefully once I make it as a director, uh, there is, I'd love to tinker with animation a bit, not personally drawing, although maybe, who knows, uh, but like to make some animated films, because again, probably because of my very creative, over the top crazy ideas, I love the freedom of animation. And there's a really good children's book in, uh, in Romania uh, that's about a penguin going on a trip, like from a circus, going be like, suddenly he realizes like he misses his family and he goes on a trip around the world to wow. find them. And of course he ends up in Antarctica. But the, the fun thing is it's got a bunch of themes. So I'd like to do that as an animation to dig deeper and not necessarily for children. Although I like doing all sorts of films from back to this, it's going to be a pretty big difference. <laughs> Less bloody, I hope. Uh, but again, um, that's sort of another product. And I'd like to do some live action adaptations of the Tintin books, uh, if you know them. As a matter of fact, here it is. One of the wow. books. <laughs> what, so what yeah, I'm here. a big Tintin fan. Again. <laughs> yeah yeah so in in the light of spielberg as well because he did do the most recent precisely and i was so it. excited when that film was coming out again was like, i wasn't like taking filmmaking seriously at that stage but i was like yeah spielberg the guy who made those films oh and he's doing a tintin film yeah so yeah <laughs> ultimate yeah. dream right there <laughs> exactly exactly and also he did it with peter jackson which ties into the fact that i want to go to new zealand uh i mean other than that it's beautiful and I want to live there. Uh, but I also like the fact that the industry is nice and like a community sort of thing. And it's actually blowing up not, right now because it's the only working without restrictions industry in the world. Um, and there's, it's a very like home. I mean, it's home, like the home of Lord of the Rings and everything, but there's a wonderful bunch of people. That's where I want to go to make films. So that's my aim, you know, and being in the UK is sort of uh, a step towards that. It's a bridge to get to New Zealand. Nice. Yeah. Well, thank you very, very much, Luca, for your time. Uh, thank I you. I, I really enjoyed this. <laughs> Good. I'm really glad to hear. Thank you again. Cheers.